is Christianity a white man's religion? And should we be looking elsewhere for our faith? That's an important question. And you may be surprised what a journey back before the days of slavery reveals about the faith of our forefathers. As you'll see, the faith of our African fathers goes back to the very first followers of Jesus Christ. Is the Christian faith the white man's religion? Africa and the Bible, next on Day of Discovery. Hello, I'm Wentley Phipps. For many people of color, the Christian faith is a faith that came with shackles. The congregation of this church built in 1850 was made up of former slaves. But today, for many of African descent, the stained glass of churches reflect a stained past. A past stained with their sweat and blood, wrung out by those of the so-called white man's religion. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Our songs of slavery were our beloved spirituals. One great writer once called the slave's musical expression of faith a disturbing kind of joy. Because as a slave, how do you embrace the faith of the one who has chained you and then find in that faith one's highest expression of joy? Even today, many of African descent still feel shackled as they see it to a white man's faith. Is the Christian faith the white man's religion? Desmond Armstrong wanted to know more about the roots of his faith. Desmond is a former Olympic and World Cup soccer player. Today, he's the father of six children, and he wanted them to know why they are a Christian family, why they follow Jesus and his teaching. And so he began a journey to understand his spiritual heritage. I kind of stumbled on the fact that um, you know, Africa in the Bible. I knew there was something going on in the Bible in regards to Africa being present in the Bible, but you never hear that. You never see it any place, and it never had a real, real connection to it. And so I wanted something that really told me, look, that's not the only thing about my faith. It didn't just start here on the shores of America. It started way back in Africa. Desmond studied his Bible and other books. Then he also decided to visit a class, a class held in Boston at the Center of Urban Ministerial Education, an extension of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. The class was made up of an ethnically diverse group of graduate students, laypersons, and clergy. The title of the course piqued Desmond's interest, Africa and Great Africans in the Bible. His only reservation was its teacher, who by all appearances was a most unlikely source of information on black history, Dr. Catherine Krager. One of the important figures of North Africa was the Bishop of Carthage. His name was Quote Volt Deus, that means what God wills. And he was a colleague of uh, St. Augustine. And uh, here we see a picture of Quote Volt Deus. However, he can also be seen with his black skin uh, where he is buried and the, the mosaic over shows that he clearly has dark skin in the San Gennaro catacomb in Naples. She was deep. She, she had her history down. She had a passion even at her age. She was, she was passionate. I mean, I felt like I need to get on the ball because this woman, she's got more energy than I do. Well, sir, he's not dead tonight. He's alive with a rousing good sermon for all you sinners who want to find Jesus from 450 A.D. You who find yourself before me this day, know this, that the words of my mouth come forth with the power of God 
Presenting the ancient sermon in period costume is a student named Mark, who's also a pastor. Here the poor are not treated one way, the rich another. The master one way, the slave another. For there is one entrance for all into life. And if this ritual, egalitarianism, is the case, in this fragile and mortal life, how much the better will it be for that immortal and everlasting life? None of the students miss the real message. They have just experienced a handshake with a distant African brother and found him to be noble, insightful, and compelling. Dr. Krager invited Desmond to interact with the students. One of my questions to you is this, as I studied blacks or Africans in the Bible and it spoke to me individually, I wanted to find out from you all, how has this enriched your lives, the coursework that you've taken here? What does it mean to you in terms of your worldview? You know, I was expecting a black person to know more about Africa, to teach the course. <laughs> so when I came here and I look at uh, Dr. Kroger, and I say, really? <laughs> you just couldn't believe it. And you know, we have learned so much in this class, it's unbelievable. Yes, yes. And things I never knew before. Because since I was like you know, a little girl, you know, and you know, I was taught that, you know, the gospel, it's like, you know, is it white? Even when you're trying to, to, uh, to witness to, like, you know, your black, my black people, they always said, you know, this is like, you know, a white people gospel. It's going to take more like a class what we have here, classes like we have here, where people can see the dynamic unfold gradually. Because to say this all in one, even if, if the ones that are sitting here, to receive it all in one swoop, would still leave you spinning and not really able to, 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 to digest it. I was thinking about what you said, Desmond, about you know the youth today. They don't know who they are. And it's, it's almost like they don't care either. But the young, the young black men that are in, incarcerated, they do tend to migrate toward the Islam religion because they think that, they believe that to be a strong black man is to be, you know, to become the Muslim. Because my son was incarcerated and he was a, you know, and of course I raised him a Christian, just like the rest of my children. And then all of a sudden he turned to, you know, he turned to the five percenters. And, you know, I didn't want to like, you know, argue back and forth with them because that's not the way that I present the gospel. But I didn't have the information that I needed to present the gospel with him from the African side. But he was more knowledgeable about me, about my, about black history. But I didn't have the Christian, the black Christian foundation. I identify with, with what you were saying earlier in regards to being confronted with knowledge um, about my own religion from someone who opposes it. And I was stumped. You know, I'm, I'm stumped. You know, how do I, how can I defend my faith if I don't have proper knowledge? That's why this is such an important course. And this topic is so important, especially for me, as I go into those areas in which I'm going to be confronted by individuals who are opposed to my religion and who are ex uh, uh, um, exemplifying power in the knowledge that they have. And that's what draws the young, the young boys. It's the power and the authority by which they speak that connotates this is true. Mm -hmm. I need to be here. And I can't come and I could not come and counter that. I could not go passionately with my own truth for Christianity. And then to stand with authority. It's the truth that we know in terms of when you talk about gathering this knowledge and the awesome responsibility of having this knowledge and almost being scared of gaining more knowledge. I don't know if I want any more God. I don't know if I can handle any more God, yes. you know? But he calls for us to move on toward maturity. Why? Because we're growing closer to him. We're, we're growing stronger in him. 
We're losing more of ourselves that we might have more of Him filling us up, that we might be able to give it over so that we can set the captives free. That's what the gospel is for. From the class in downtown Boston, it takes a little less than two hours to reach the old historic New England community on Cape Cod. Desmond's been invited to Dr. Krieger's house. Well, hi, you found me. Yes, I All did. All the way Pleasure. on Cape Cod. Bless your heart, come in. Well, Great Great Grandmother built this while Great 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 Grandfather was at sea in 1799. Okay. And we've, it's been in the family ever since. Now, uh, this used to be uh, the front parlor where grand people were entertained. You're a grand person, so I'll bring you in here. Here in 1802, the town fathers met and divided up the town of Brewster from the town of Harwich. They were having a church fight and they weren't getting along too well. <laughs> so what came out of that? Well, uh, the town of Brewster was formed. They were so mad they spattered ink all over the desk. And uh, great-great-grandfather became the first representative to the House of Representatives in Boston. And you talk about your great-great-grandfather. You have a great and long lineage here. Look at this bed. Uh, this is where my ancestors were conceived, born, and died. And I live in the same house with it. I have this very strong sense of history, and it's so important. And oh, that we could find this kind of history for African-American people. No question, you have a lot of things that are passed down from generation to generation that link you to your past. As for me, I can only go as back as far as my grandmother's grandmother. So I find that I want to go back further, maybe to Africa, but it's cut off for me. Well, I believe there are ways of tracing it, and they're difficult. Um, often people haven't cared, they have mislaid things, but they can be retrieved inch by inch. It takes a lot of effort. But it's important to do. All of us need to know who we are and where we came from, what our roots were. No question. I think your research gives us a great opportunity as African Americans to then trace that back as you're talking. And also to understand what our spiritual roots are. Uh, faith of our fathers, holy faith. Uh, such precious and wonderful saints of God that, that we're Africans. Uh, we need to claim that faith. All of us need that. But it's so important, I think, for African Americans to understand what their tradition is. Here's a book you might be interested in. Um, it is my Greek New Testament, but down at the bottom of the page, it lists uh, how texts can be reconstructed. What uh, were other versions? After all, every, uh, trend, uh, every copy of the New Testament had to be done by hand. I've told you about Code Voltaeus, the Bishop of Carthage. Look how important he is. Again and again, he is quoted, and I underline every time that he turns up, because he's so important in the history of preservation of the scriptures and interpretation of the scriptures. Dr. Catherine Krieger is not content to simply teach classes about Africa and great Africans in the Bible. Though now in her 80s, she's leading a study tour to Africa, and she'll tell you why. To instill in persons of African descent a sense of confidence in God's love for them, in God's empowerment for them, in God's place of importance for them. The main motivation for my attending the study tour was really to find out truth and really deal with a lot of the misconceptions that I've experienced as an African American from my own people, you know, and from people of other heritage as well. The study tour views copies of ancient Egyptian drawings on papyrus paper. Using papyrus to make paper is one of the oldest processes in the world. The papyrus paper can last for thousands of years in the dry climate of Egypt. In fact, the oldest known manuscript fragment of the New Testament ever found was discovered here in Egypt. The papyrus manuscript has been dated between 125 and 250 AD. It contains verses from the Gospel of John, chapter 18. One side is translated to read, Therefore Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. 
For this I was born, and for this I have come into society to witness to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? John 18 What is truth? This fragment stands as a witness and as evidence not only to the truth about Jesus the King, but the truth about the story of Jesus reaching Africa, just a few decades after the Apostle John originally wrote his gospel. Jerusalem is only a few days walk from Egypt. Jerusalem, where Jesus revealed his identity. It's Palm Sunday. These Ethiopian Orthodox Christians carry palm branches as reminders, reminders of the day when Jesus entered Jerusalem, welcomed with palm branches by the Jewish people, welcomed as the Messiah, the King, just a few days before he was crucified. What is interesting is that these Ethiopian Orthodox Christians trace their spiritual beginnings back to one man, back to one of the first Gentiles to follow Jesus, the man the Bible names as the Ethiopian eunuch. And behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Acts chapter 8. But did the Ethiopian eunuch actually come from the country we know today as Ethiopia? Now, of course, there's also the key passage in Acts 8 about the so-called Ethiopian eunuch. And that can be somewhat misleading because the term Ethiopia comes from the Greek word Ethiops, which meant literally sunburned face. And this was used by the Greeks of natives who were of dark complexion, including natives in India, but primarily the area south of Egypt, which is today the modern country of the Sudan. Now, we know more specifically the exact location of the kingdom from which this official came, because he is called the treasurer of Queen Candace. And Candace is derived from a title called Kandake, which is the name of the Queen Mother of the Kingdom of Meroe. German author and scholar Dr. Roland Werner has researched Christian history in Africa. But we do not only find it in the Bible, we also have a lot of inscriptions in old Meroitic temples in the north of Sudan that give this title of the Queen Mother a Candace. So we can clearly identify uh, the country that this man in Acts 8 came from. He came from Meroe. And the Meroitic Empire, again, was a very powerful empire. Uh, and it was often ruled by a queen mother by the name of Katoki or Kandake, or as we say in English, of Candace. And here we have a sandstone relief of uh, one of these queens. We don't know her name. But what is interesting is that she is uh, in a very African, portrayed in a very African way. She has two Egyptian goddesses on either side, and these goddesses have these uh, amphora, or these jugs, uh, over their kneel, knees with water pouring out. This is to symbolize the, uh, the abundance of water, of life that comes from the Nile, and that she, as the queen, uh, provides in a way for her people. There, there is a bracelet that once adorned the arm of a Kandasi from the first century AD. Uh, was she the queen for whom the royal treasurer went to Jerusalem? Well, we don't know. The church fathers were very much excited by the story of how Philip had brought a Ethiopian treasurer, a high court official to Christ, because they knew that meant that the gospel had gone deep into Africa and that it had been taken by a dark-skinned person. As uh, Philip approached the uh, carriage, he heard uh, the Meritic court official reading out loud a portion from the book of Isaiah, which he had bought in Jerusalem, uh, probably in Greek. And the reason we know that he was able to understand Greek is that we have evidence that at this time a Greek was used as a court language in the kingdom of Meroe. 
So they were able to converse in a common language and they spoke uh, about what this meant and Philip asked him, do you understand what you read? And uh, the Meritic court official said, how can I unless somebody explains it to me? And then this is this beautiful story of how he then decided uh, to, to be baptized. He understood what the prophecy meant and how it had been fulfilled in Jesus. The prophecy describes a suffering Messiah. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak for his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Acts chapter 8. Now we don't know what happened uh, to this man afterwards. It says in Acts 8 that he went on his way rejoicing and probably he was rejoicing all the way till he was back down in the Sudan. Uh, church history is uh, throughout the last 2,000 years almost has been very Eurocentric. Um, you know, usually we, I mean, we've seen it in the art that we've seen that um, kind of the post medieval period uh, paintings that we've seen in the Coptic churches portray white Jesuses and that reflects the history of a Eurocentric focus on Christ, on the church. And, and, we, and we say it today that, you know, even, you know, among African Americans, we say, you know, we struggle with, you know, Christianity is a white man's religion and that's the attraction to this, uh, Islam. But, but I think the implications of this trip are just tremendous that this isn't, um, this, is, this isn't a white man's religion, but it's everybody's religion. And that, um, and I just think the implications are strong for the black church, for the white church, for moving away from a Eurocentric focus on Christianity to an all-inclusive one. The church began as a Jewish Christian movement, first of all. All the early disciples, Jesus himself, Paul, were all Jewish. And gradually through, especially the efforts of Paul, more and more Gentiles, non-Jews were converted. Paul's journeys are sort of north by northwest. Um, he becomes a sort of poster child, among other things, of European Christianity. He's the first person to take Christianity to Europe. He goes to Greece, right? he, he crosses over from Asia Minor, and he's now in Europe. And um, he writes to Rome. Uh, he's in contact with, with, uh, with Christians throughout Greece. And uh, this is how um, Christianity um, uh, gets its start. First of all, we have an unbalanced and skewed picture of the spread of Christianity because our best narrative sources are centered around the mission of St. Paul. Now, if you're not a person of European descent, but you're a Christian, there can be a kind of dissonance there, right? It can be a kind of disconnect. Well, ancient Christianity has been African too, not just European. It's been European, it is European, but it's African too. And um, it's been African at least as long as it was European. And that Christianity isn't something that uh, arrived on African shores you know, in the modern period with European colonialism. Uh, we always see physical portrayals of Jesus as being blonde hair, blue eyed, li lily white skin. And for us, uh, at least in the deep south, there was always a belief that, you know, God's white. And in modern terms, in modern day, I should say, we understand that Jesus came from a land in which, you know, the people are dark hue doesn't mean that they're actually black or African it just means that he, he's definitely not blonde hair and blue eye that's the first thing the second thing is the fact that within scripture itself it doesn't give a physical description of Jesus Christ for a good reason we need to focus on what Christ actually did what he said and how to apply his word to our individual lives so his physical presence and description becomes less meaningful we don't focus on that we don't become uh, so fixated on it that it becomes an icon for us or an idol but that Jesus himself who he is the presence of him becomes so much more powerful for us based off of his word when the Son of God came to this earth he was born right where three continents meet Africa Asia and Europe and Jesus lived and died and rose again in the land of Israel right at the crossroads where people of all colors would trade and travel. 
Jesus strategically came to all nations and he purposely came to make us one in him. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I'm Wintley Phipps. Let's go to church. I'm going to tell you about the coming of the judgment. I'm going to tell you about the coming of the judgment. Yes, there's a better day coming. Yes, there's a better day coming. In that break in the morning, fare you well, fare you well. In that break in the morning, fare you well, fare you well. In that break in the morning, fare you well, fare you well. In that break in the morning, fare you well, fare you well.